the other day, hell, that's been thirty years ago. Um, and then also, some friends of mine during the Gulf War, they uh, landed cargo, and they'd get over Cairo, and they'd get, they'd give them to Middle East Control, which were Americans, and they and it was always at night, and they'd give them this left, right, up, down stuff, you know, and then then turn on your lights, and there was a runway, and they'd land, and taxi the end, and then they'd uh, <coughs> unload, and then um, pull away and then give them the heading of the runway. You know, they couldn't see anything. It was just absolutely black. And then when they took off, um, you know, all they had was the runway lights. And then they'd go to Middle East Command. Where was that based? The just northeast, northwest of her guide house. Right oh, there. okay. There's so much um, background noise. And this room has been under uh, Radio okay. surveillance this since. Is, uh, John Lear, take one. Take one! <laughs> okay, John. Okay, this room has been under uh, surveillance both by the uh, British and the American since uh, 1986, and I'm not sure why it started then. And uh, for some reason, um, no uh, electronic information getting from this room into the living room and they're they're broadcasting or pulling information that way so um, I've had the telephone people up here and they say yeah it's your phone well this is in the old days when they used to tap phones your phone was tapped at the mainframe and there's no paperwork to go with it and, uh, and then they got all this newfangled stuff and uh, they take, they come in here and they take what they want. And I, uh, you know. Uh, when they say they come. When they say they come in here, do they sort of arrive out of thin air like they did with Dr. Rowney Kilda? Right, I've never seen him. I've never seen anybody That's in here. That's what I mean. There's stuff, just stuff misses, missing. Such as? Oh, photos that I keep in here, the Benowitz photos. The Benowitz photos were uh, the stuff that he shot out of his, uh, that he took out of his house. He lived, uh, just above and outside of the uh, Monzano weapons storage area behind uh, Kirtland Air Force Base. And he would see the saucers taking off and he uh, rigged up a um, television uh, recording uh, thing. He would record a, a TV screen. Those are the days we didn't have, none of this existed. You know, the stuff we have. And um, then he took stills of the little domes that would land there and then take off. So, you know, a lot of stuff has disappeared. I'm trying to remember what the That's, what I noticed the other day. That would be stuff that you would personally notice, and you would personally know where it was. Yeah, yeah. So they see with your eyes. Pardon? They see and hear with your ears and your eyes. Absolutely. That's how it works. Is that spooky or what? It was when I first learned about it, but uh, <clears throat> now it's just normal. Who was the real John Lear? Oh, I um, keep seeing that. I'm going to put it in. I'm not sure who the real John Lear is. I was, uh, the, I was picked for a very special mission, and uh, I'm just kind of learning out about it now. The first 40 years of my life, I was a pilot and uh, really enjoyed it. I, uh, I did everything there was to do, flying, flew everywhere, flew everything. Uh, and I, I flew in the best of times, like in the Middle East, in Africa. Uh, it was before the British came down there and started organizing stuff. We could get away with anything, you know, and, uh, and get away with. I mean, we could transfer uh, arms and, and ammunition uh, anywhere all over the Middle East and in Africa. And then the British started coming in and telling the, uh, the various governments how to, uh, uh, how to check on airplanes that came in and how to check IDs and, and how to uh, figure out who owned a particular airplane and whether it was properly registered, that kind of stuff. So we had one airplane that uh, we based out of Cairo and on, the, on one side it was all Equatorial Guinea airline markings and on the other side it was all Liberia markings. So wherever we'd go into, 
that was uh, particularly friendly to one or two of the, one of the governments or the others, that's the way we'd park so that the tower could see, oh yeah, they're Equatorial Guinea, they're okay, you know, so. Um, and then for parts, we had a uh, run out of uh, Khartoum and we'd take cattle uh, to the, um, um, to, uh, let's see, uh, what was it? Sudan, not the Sudan. Aden, North Aden. We'd fly into Sana, North Sana. There was a nice runway there, and we were flying a, I was flying an old 707 that had the uh, Rolls Royce engines on it. And uh, we would take cattle, and it wasn't a cargo configuration 707, it was just passenger. Uh, and of course, we'd take all the passenger seats out, and then we'd load the cattle, and we'd fly them into um, <coughs> Sana and unload there. Oh, was it anything special about the cows? Yeah, just cows to feed the soldiers. They were buying them from the Sudan. And um, <clears throat> the way that we supported our airplane got parts is there was one 707 that was wrecked off the side of the runway in uh, Sana, and then um, Air, Air uh, Sudan had landed short of the runway in Khartoum about two miles short of the runway in the Nile and there was a 707 that was just parked in the middle of the runway, and we got parts from that, mainly from the tail and stuff like that. So those were our spare parts, our supply of spare parts. But uh, the main base was up in uh, Egypt, and it was, uh, <clears throat> the company was named Air Trans, and um, the head on show was Hank Wharton, who was one of the premier gun runners uh, of the uh, century. And uh, he's who I worked for. And when I was in Cairo, uh, that was the um, that was when Bush was uh, trying to get elected over. No, no, Reagan was trying to get elected over uh, um, Carter. In, and then you remember the October surprise? That was in the um, uh, October of uh, 1980, <clears throat> and. Um, Bush went over to Paris to meet with a, with representatives of Khomeini, and I forget what the name of the guy was, but... This is the, when Bush was in the CIA? He was director, yeah. Director. And so um, his deal was to the Khomeini, if you delay the release of the hostages uh, until Reagan's uh, inauguration, if he's inaugurated, we'll give you unlimited arms and ammunition for the rest of our administration. So the Khomeini did delay the release of the hostages. And um, <clears throat> then when uh, Reagan was uh, uh, elected, uh, they started funneling arms into Tehran uh, through Tel Aviv. And I was supposed to fly those arms, but what happened is, and this was in 91 when they finally got around to, to uh, delivering them, what happened is the first, they, uh, Mossad was running the operation. And they uh, <clears throat> sent in an Argentinian CL-44 as a first run because they didn't want to risk the 707s uh, getting uh, uh, downed or anything in case anybody was going to get upset. And the CL-44 went into Iran, dropped the arms, and then on its way out, the Russians shot it down 30 miles south of the air van. And uh, nobody could figure out why they got shot down because they knew that... Uh, there was false beacons there. We'd all been briefed exactly what the route was. You know, there should have been no problem. They didn't have anything on board, you know. So the only thing we can figure is that uh, that the crew, uh, that the Russia sent down MiGs to, you know, force them into Russia, to, to put them, you know, force them down. And the crew probably said, well, hey, we got nothing on board. We'll just follow them. So as soon as they got inside the border of Russia, they just shot them down. And the message was, uh, don't take these arms to Tehran. They let you get the arms in, but not out. In other words, uh, the arms you... were delivered by the U.S. to Zaragoza, and then um, the Israelis would pick it up in Zaragoza and transfer it to Tel Aviv, and then we'd pick it up in Tel Aviv, and our mission was taken from Tel Aviv to Tehran. So <clears throat> I never did that because when the CL-44 got shot down, the whole operation went to the uh, Gulf. They used either used Qatar 
or um, uh, Dubai or one of those places, and they took it just across the Gulf to Tehran. I never found out what how they or whether they delivered the the arms were, were delivered, but I don't know how. What kind of arms? Uh, whatever the um, Iranians had ordered, whatever it was, you know, just small arms. That's about all we can take in those airplanes. Uh, it was about that time. <clears throat> that we were taking arms from uh, Athens, Greece, to Johannesburg. And uh, I remember, let's see, let's spend, I don't remember what the year, I knew, the year was uh, 81 or something, and there was one last flight to be made uh, out of Athens, and the government was going to change the next day. And I don't know what they had in the airplane, um, but uh, it, it was at night in uh, Athens, and uh, I remember Hank came out and he said, uh, you're pretty heavy, so you can, uh, you can stop and refuel in Nairobi and then go on down to Johannesburg. And uh, the one thing you don't want to do is when you have arms is stop halfway. And uh, so uh, it gives too many uh, people too much of a chance to look at what you got. So I kind of figured it out. I said, I think I can make it nonstop, Hank. And he said, well, I'll give you a thousand extra if you make it nonstop. Ah, no problem. So I told the crew that we were going to take off way over gross weight at Athens going to the north there. And, uh, but no problem. We went up, took it over, and uh, took it off and climbed to altitude. And Hank always claimed that he would get his clearance for the different countries, but he never did. So, yeah, Europe's a bit, that's a bit, what? It's a bit tricky. Yeah. Not even before civil so, uh, my uh, co-pilot name was Munchie because always was munching stuff. We get down over um, Cairo was no problem, but we get down uh, over uh, Sudan and we meet the uh, FIR and the flight information region, and we have to report in. <clears throat> and uh, Munchie goes uh, Sudan, Sudan, uh, Boeing uh, five two six uh, estimate. Or, or over uh, Khartoum and two six estimate the border one one, you know, uh, over, and Sudan would come up and say um, Khartoum, Khartoum, uh, Roger, uh, please give us your overflight clearance number. And uh, then Munchie would go, Khartoum, Khartoum, Khartoum. This is Boeing five two six uh, over Khartoum at uh, two six flight level three five zero. Estimate the FIR at. Uh, Four niner over, <laughs> and then Sudan would come or Khartoum would come back. Seven oh seven, we demand the you know that you give us the overclight clearance, you know. So it was at night, and who what they were going to send up, you know, to shoot us down, I don't know, but it was a lot of fun working with them. And I think the the, the total time to Johannesburg was eleven hours, <clears throat> and we made it nonstop. So that was a nice flight. This is the Khartoum operation. That was. Hank Wharton, he's the guy that we work for, and this is uh, Joe Weber, my engineer, and this was a uh, Khartoum, or a Sudan co-pilot, and this was taken in Cairo, and that's in the cockpit, and there's another picture here, oh, that's in Sana right there, yeah, that's in Sana. Just stalled it, just stalled them all the way across. Talking that's what didn't Pardon? Talking clap trap. Right. <laughs> But who was the, the, the arms for in South Africa? <clears throat> I don't know who those were for, but uh, during the um, Falkland War, we had a deal. It never came off, but um, what the, uh, my part of it was to fly the airplane to Ostend, Belgium, and uh, wait at the airport, and then France was going to send the Exocet missiles in the train up to Ostend, and they would they said that they would leave them at the, the uh, yard there, the train yard, for two hours and then go back to France. And if we could get it off, we could get the Exocets off in that time, uh, then we could have them. Otherwise, they weren't going to wait. And so it, everything had to come into place for, for this to happen, and it never happened. But uh, um, we were supposed to... Uh, take the exocets from um, Austin to direct nonstop to Johannesburg. 
or not, not we were going to land at Sal, which belongs to uh, an island that belongs to Portugal in the middle of the Atlantic, and then nonstop to Johannesburg. And Johannesburg was shipping them to the Argentinians, uh, who were going to blow up, you know, use them for the British. But that was a, a big secret in those days, and uh, France didn't want the British to know that they were really, you know, sending those Exocet missiles. Uh, and then in 1977, uh, got a call to uh, uh, go to Frankfurt. I wasn't working at the time, I don't think. Let's see. Yeah. I, oh, I was working for Nevada Airlines, flying DC-3s out of the canyon. And uh, this guy calls up and he says, uh, I hear you're 707 qualified. Uh, do you want to go to work for a couple of weeks or a couple of months? Uh, it's a classified mission. Oh, yeah, sure, okay. He says, okay, we'll go to Frankfurt and check into the hotel at the airport, and uh, I'll call you there. And I said, okay, well, how do I get paid um, for the airplane trip? And he said, well, you you pay for it, and I'll reimburse you when you get to, the, get to Frankfurt. So usually I don't do that, but I thought, well, okay, let's do that. So we went to Frankfurt, and I checked into the hotel, and uh, there was a uh, phone call and the guy said, um, meet, you know, let me see, he said, uh, be at uh, Lufthansa at 9 in the morning, and there's uh, will be tickets to go to Budapest. And um, uh, you'll meet some other people who will introduce themselves. So the next morning showed up at the uh, counter at Frankfurt there, and there was tickets waiting to go to Budapest. And... Um, I saw some other Americans standing around, I, and I knew those guys. I said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, well, you don't think you're going to get in on a deal like this without us, do you? And I said, oh, yeah, well, I guess not. <clears throat> so we went to, uh, got on Lufthansa, went to uh, Hungary, to Budapest. And when we went through customs, as we gave our passports to the guy, there was an American guy standing behind the, the uh, Budapest customs who reached over and got the passport and just gave the guy a nod and then we went through and then we uh, we were supposed to go to the international hotel which we did and then there was a note to uh, meet that evening at 10 o'clock in room such and such uh, with all these guys and it was like about 10 or 10 or 11 I have a picture around here of the uh, mystery crew we used to call it the mystery crew it's a mystery crew. There's a picture over there. That's my back operation. Oh, then, well, to me, it looks like an ass, if you ask me. It looks like a bum, but, you know. Well, we had to shoot it from that. This is a Saudi Gazette for the one of the days we were doing it, and the name Mystery Crew came from this article, and it said, Mystery 707 Flying Zarns to Somalia. And then it says, uh, mystery Boeing 707 airliner apparently loaded with arms was landed at Mogadishu Airport on each of the last three days. Uh, one European airline executive said the tail was painted yellow, but beneath the coat of paint, the emblem of the West Condor or the West German uh, charter airline Condor could be seen. He said he saw Somali soldiers unloading chests of the kind needed for packing light arms and ammunition. And so then... <clears throat> this, so this is when you were working for the company? Or Air, or Air America? Yeah, no. Uh, I always worked contract. Uh, not, you know, I didn't have a folder with the company. Uh, the, the Air America stuff was over in Southeast Asia. And uh, that was a whole bunch of different stuff. That's the so 70s? We, pardon? Is that in the 1970s? That was 1967 to 1970. Uh, 1973. Yeah, 67 to 73. So how does John get into the uh, airplane business? Uh, well, my dad, um, uh, hold on just a second, and I'll tell you that. I just want to finish this off right here. That's the mystery crew. And that's, that's me where the yellow is, and that's all the guys that were in now. Uh, so how did I get into, uh, well, my dad was, uh, he owned a, had owned and started a company called uh, Lear Incorporated. 
Uh, he and Paul Galvin had started the original Motorola in uh, the early 20s, and uh, <clears throat> they had developed uh, radio stuff, and uh, one of the important things that my dad alleges that he invented was the B battery eliminator, which allowed you to play a radio in a car without the static um, ruining the uh, the audio. Uh, but anyway, he decided... That's a filter to, system? Pardon? Some kind of filter? Yeah, the B battery eliminator. That was specific of the, the stuff that, or the thing that they'd put in to keep the uh, static from going through the audio. So then he decided to sell his interest in Motorola to Paul Galvin, and then he started his own company named Lear Incorporated. And Lear Incorporated uh, spent the next uh, 25, uh, 26 years uh, selling, building, uh, designing <coughs> a radio equipment and mechanical and pump equipment for the uh, Air Force. Uh, and in 1960, in 1955, uh, he had built an airplane called the Learstar, which was a modification of the Lockheed 18 uh, for executives. And I think Lear Incorporated built about 62 of them, and they were not a financial uh, success. So then in 1957, when he wanted to build the Learjet, his board of directors told him no, and uh, he um, sold his stock in Lear Inc. to Siegler, became Lear Siegler Corporation, and then he took the money and formed Lear Jet Corporation. And uh, it was in 55, 56 that I was learning how to fly, and there was always airplanes at the airport that I could just use that belonged to Lear Incorporated. So that's how I started flying. But he didn't like me flying. He wanted me to be a, an artist or a... Uh, he wanted you to be an artist? An artist. And uh, he sent an artist over when we lived in Pacific Palisades and I set up the easel on the on the front lawn and and sit there and learn how to paint on on Saturday mornings. But I wanted to be out at the airport, so I'd go out there and, and spend a lot of time out there. And <clears throat> So that's basically how I started. And then uh, in 1963, um, I had, well, in 1963, I had been involved in a, an accident, airplane accident, which really destroyed me. Right behind you is that uh, picture, and I just wonder if I can call it up here quickly. Um, yeah. There. That's a Buker 131, and, and uh, <clears throat> I was doing aerobatics and uh, misjudged my altitude. And I was sitting right there, and my face went right through that Thing and it just went straight in, so I didn't have much of a chance to uh, help myself or protect myself. So I don't know what all the other pictures are. A Buker Youngman and uh, 131. And so it was two place, and that's the front. And I didn't, nobody was sitting in the front, and I was in the back, and it just went straight in. I really, I hurt myself so bad that I remember going to Geneva in an ambulance, which is about 45 minutes away from the boarding school I used to go to. <clears throat> and I remember floating above my body and looking down and, and saying, nope, you're hurt too bad, you're not going to make it. Just, it can't, can't happen. But somehow I, uh, well, I know how I got protected. So anyway, <clears throat> I ended up in uh, Santa Monica. It took me a year to recover and recoup, and uh, I started, uh, uh, instructing at Hawthorne Airport and uh, just doing little jobs. Uh, went over and instructed at uh, Van Nuys Beechcraft. <clears throat> and um, then my dad invited me back to the factory to get checked out in the Lear. And I went back and got checked out in it. And then I was trying to find a job flying the Learjet. And um, I found a job flying for the uh, Flying Tiger line, flying their Learjet. What is the special thing about the Learjet? Why is it so famous? Everybody knows because about the Because it was the first. It was the first business jet, and it had the pizzazz, and it had the tick tanks, and uh, all, all the rich people were buying it at the very beginning. And, it, and ever after that, no matter if there was 10 different types of business jets manufactured, everybody called them the Learjet, which they weren't. But that's why it was, that was the thing in the beginning. It was just the airplane to have. So, um, and that would have been the first small 
executive light, uh, you know, jet, jet, jet craft without being a Boeing 707 almost. It, was, it really was a revolution. Right. It was just a small executive jet, and it was the first time that, you know, business people could have their own airplane without having to rely on uh, large airliners to take them any place. So then I got to fly in that in uh, 1967. I applied for a job to ferry, they wanted pilots to ferry um, the uh, FAC airplane, which was a uh, uh, O2A and B, over to Vietnam, and I applied for that, and I didn't know that it was uh, CIA, but that was the first CIA job, and I don't know where I have that, let's see if I can find it. What type of aircraft is that, a FAC, F-A-C? Ford Air Control. It was this airplane. Uh, should I see if I can find it? What's the name of that thing? Back. B under F. It's uh, it's amazing that you didn't get scared off after nearly killing yourself. Uh, well, I knew and it was my fault. You know, if I'd have done things other than that, I'd, I'd uh, had no problem. There, right, there it is. That's over in Cambodia. That's not it. Anyway, when I find that airplane, that's the one that I was ferrying. And uh, I ferried those from 1967 until 1970, 1970 over to Vietnam. And then we'd get uh, a ticket back and we'd come through Hong Kong and uh, back to Wichita, pick up an airplane and uh, get back to Wichita and uh, deliver another one. And then that ended in uh, 1971, and your question was... Um, what got you into the company? You know, I applied for this job buying these airplanes, and it turns out that it was a CIA operation. And um, so I just kept doing that. <clears throat> and then um, in 19... Uh, uh, when I got back, or when I finished that contract, I flew uh, charter in the Learjet. 1972, and I heard about this job over in Cambodia flying Convairs. So I applied for that, and that's where these pictures come from. This is in Cambodia. And uh, What sort of aircraft is that? When you mention the aircraft, I'm keen to figure out what's, the, what, what's its function. That was a Convair 440. It was a 52-passenger airline, and it flew passengers from uh, Phnom Penh to Battambang in the north, and to Compensan in the uh, southwest. And it was owned by uh, Tri-9 Airlines. And the name of the, uh, the airline was uh, Khmer Akas. And uh, did that for a few months. And then I heard about this uh, job uh, that was opening up in, uh, or that was open in Vincent Laws. And uh, I went to, um, it was my co-pilot that told me, and I said, how do I get on? He said, well, you go down down Phnom Penh here to the Swiss Indo Shipping and Trading and ask for Kurt Fuhrer and tell him you want to go to work for uh, Continental. Continental Air Services, Inc. was who was running it. So there's a book over on that shelf there, and it's called, uh, it was written by one of the spy books. And John Le Carre wrote it, and in the cover, You'll see the um, notification. Escape from Laos? Is that one? It's a big, thick one. No, it's a th this one. What's the title? Escape from Laos? No. Is that it's, one? It's a big, thick one. No, it's a th no, it's John Le Carre. Uh, John Le Carre, down to your left, and it's called um, the Schoolboy. Honorable Schoolboy. That's what it's called. Mm -hmm. On your left, behind the telescope. John Le Carre, the Honorable Schoolboy. It's a real thick black one. You should see it right there. Now just thumb that open and see the, the uh, card in there announces um, Kurt Fuhrer. That's Kurt Fuhrer's announcement that he was killed. And it turns out that he was the head of the Swiss CIA in Phnom Penh. And that's who I went to to, to find out that job up in Laos. And I... Uh, Kurt took my information, gave it to uh, 
U.S. and then a guy came through and interviewed me and that's how I ended up in Vinci. No, just get the shot of the back, okay? That's the guy. <clears throat> this is a book called Private Warriors by Ken Silverstein and it came out oh maybe 10 15 years ago and before it came out, there was a story in Harper's Magazine, and uh, it mentioned Bill Lear Jr., but what they meant, it was me. And so my brother called up, and he said, hey, that wasn't me, that was my brother John, and it had already gone to print, so they changed it at the last minute in the book, and in the book, they were able to change the name because... <clears throat> because John Lear is the same letters as Bill Lear Jr., who they originally put that, and the only thing that tells you what they did is they say John Lear Jr., and I'm not Jr., I'm Senior. My brother is Bill Lear Jr. Anyway, it says here, Wharton round up crew members to fly them, among them Larry Rabb, a retired U.S. Airman, Alberto Alberti, a, Cub a Cuban exile who helped lead the Bay of Pigs operation, and John Lear, son of the inventor, of the Learjet. Between runs from Budapest to Jeddah, the Saudis granted stopover rights for fueling to Mogadishu. The pilot stayed in Salzburg where Glatt put them up in the hotel barrel off. Anyway, on and on and on. Anyway, a lot of this is about that. And I phoned up Ken Silverstein and he says, I couldn't find you. And I said, well, I'm here in Las Vegas. So he said, I would have loved to talk to you about those days. And one of the interesting things is along in the book here, he talks about a different airline and reading the records of where certain airplanes went. And uh, he put, I guess I can't find it here. Could be here. Oh, right here. He put, the torpedoes were picked up in an airfield near Gdansk and flown to Andrews Air Force Base by Kalila. It has K-A-L-I-H-A, -A, commercial freight shipper. It's not Kalila, it's Coletta. That's who I worked for. And uh, Connie Coletta ran that airline, but somehow he couldn't read the, uh, the writing. So anyway, that was kind of an interesting book. But um, we met at this hotel room, uh, at the International Hotel Room, and uh, <clears throat> we got a phone call to go to this certain room number, and we all met there, and there was like about... 12 of us, and uh, Wharton comes in, and I didn't know him, and uh, he uh, holds up this little piece of paper as he comes in, and we're all saying hello. It just said, remember, walls listen, and he held it up, pointed at each of us, and then he said, uh, welcome to Budapest. You'll find uh, Hungary is a really nice uh, place to visit, particularly in the beginning of the uh, late fall here, and he said, outdoors, uh, he said, we have the damage running by uh, uh, separating uh, Budapest. He said, Buddha is on the north, Pest is on the south. And, and uh, he kills with this dialogue. And as he's telling this dialogue, he has this piece of paper. And the piece of paper is in that logbook there in the thing. But he takes it to each one of us as we're sitting here and hands it to that guy and points at him. And the guy is supposed to read it. And all the time he's carrying on this dialogue about taking a, you know, a, a tour around Budapest. And then when that guy's done with it, he picks the paper and points at that guy and he reads it. And uh, all the long he's telling about this. And anyway, at the end he gets, he says, uh, now we're going to go have some dinner and we're going to show you uh, the, uh, the great chain bridge out here. So we, uh, we go out to the... Uh, chain bridge which is in front of the hotel and that's a picture of it over there I think and we get in the middle of this change bridge and uh, he said okay here's what we're doing we're taking uh, arms to Mogadishu you're gonna stop in Jeddah and here's the flight numbers you're gonna use coming out of uh, Budapest and uh, here's the flight numbers you're gonna use coming back and just all the essential information 
And then he said, uh, as far as anybody, don't answer any questions. If anybody corners you, you say that you're taking agricultural equipment to Africa. So anyway, that ended up being the flying those uh, Budapest. Um, what happened was uh, in those days, uh, Mogadishu, Somalia had been supported by uh, Russia and they had old Russian and East Bloc guns. And um, so the Russians had built the deep water port on the north of Somalia called Berbera. And it's very important, remember this is 1977, it was very important to get real estate on the Red Sea because they knew that when they started attracting Iran that eventually the Straits of Hormuz would be closed. And the only way to get oil out of the Middle East would be to ship it to Yanbu on the Red Sea and then have it come by tankers either through the um, uh, Suez Canal north or south through the Gulf of Aden. So it was important to get real estate uh, right at the Gulf of Aden. Well, so that was when the uh, Russians made the mistake of arming um, the Ethiopian rebels and... Um, the Eritreans. What? The Eritreans. Yeah. And uh, Somali said, well, if you're going to arm our friends, you can get out of here. And they kicked them out. But then they get ready to have a war and they don't have any ammunition. Well, you know, uh, Russian or East Bloc ammunition has always been one millimeter um, larger than West Bloc so that they can use our ammunition, but we can't use theirs. So we had to, we offered to arm, hey, Somali, let us help you out here, you know, if we can just have that deep water port. Yeah, no problem. So I wound up taking all the West Block, uh, all the East Block ammunition out of Budapest um, down to Somalia for the wars that were being fought for where, wherever. Well, yeah, that was the beginning of Somalia, and we're seeing the fruits of uh, what I did in those days, getting Berbera. Um, the reason that the U.S., I think, is waiting to attack Iran is because they need to be sure that uh, they have Aden and that no help out of, can come out of uh, Aden to block that, the Gulf of Aden, because the Gulf of Aden is a real small place there. And uh, so then lately you've heard that we've had stories about Al-Qaeda, uh, <clears throat> you know, the bad guys um, collecting in uh, Aden to do this and to do that. That's not true, but we're saying that so that we have a reason to put our, to put uh, soldiers uh, into uh, aid to protect the North part. So. And of course, the British were in there beforehand after the war. So can I ask you about were you ever involved in uh, anything in Afghanistan in those days? It was Soviet; they were there. But uh, were you? Uh, we know that at some point. Uh, uh, no, I flew. Working with some of the the local kings and lords. So. Oh, I flew into Kabul uh, in uh, '76 and '77 uh, when I was flying for uh, Trans Mediterranean Airways out of Beirut, and it was so fascinating because Afghanistan has been a fascinating uh, area uh, for me. And I was reading James Michener's Caravans at the time which is about the history of Afghanistan and all the interesting things that are there. And it just happened when I was reading that, I was flying in there. So we'd stay overnight there and I'd spend, as soon as we landed, you know, I'd grab a taxi and go to, you know, in each and every place that I could um, to see all this stuff. And I was gonna uh, take my wife on a vacation around Afghanistan that summer, but I got transferred to Bangkok and I couldn't do it. I'm sorry now because been a lot of changes in Afghanistan since then. So you, in the 70s, where the Russians were having a hard time there, because the... Right. They were supported by the CIA. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Russians. Uh, yeah. Al-Qaeda yeah. was formed by the CIA to fight the Russians. Yeah, we know that. But you weren't in there with weapons or, of, you know, doing hard hardware. Oh, this was, this was 76 and 77, and none of that was happening then. The Russians didn't go in until, what, the 80s? No, it was before, wasn't it? Couldn't have been much before, because they weren't there when I was going in there. Yeah. So then the uh, Mogadishu came to a, a close and uh, came over here. That was when we lived in Cairo, and our kids were young, and it was just tough on Marilee. And uh, How many kids did you have? 
What was it like being I have two with Marilee and two with my first wife. I have total four, all girls. And um, oh my God! I promise. Oh yeah, God. right. I promised Marilee that uh, let me finish that work in Cairo, and then we would come back here, and I get a local job. So we did, and I got a job uh, flying for um, different airlines, passengers. Uh, you know, worldwide stuff, but stuff that I could be home So to eventually. speak, you got a day job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, I got a day job. But can I ask again about this accident you had? And then you, you, you take a year to get well again, to get on your feet again, and then you start flying again. Can you say more about that? It's, it's a bit, you know. Yeah, well, the problem was that I'd broken my uh, ankles, shattered my ankles, and broke my legs in three places, lost all my teeth, broke my jaw, but uh, through my career, it was, it was, uh, I was so interested in flying that I didn't let the pain bother me of my feet. My feet were uh, in, in uh, Geneva in uh, 1961. Um, they didn't have any reconstructive surgery. Uh, all they did was cast the wound. So uh, that when um, I got older, it was going to start causing me problems, which I didn't pay attention to because I was having a lot of fun flying. So then after I retired, uh, I got time to think about it, sitting behind this desk, and it got worse and worse and worse. So uh, um, I ha still have it, and I use uh, medication to control it. Uh, but the reason you have pain is because you're paying for something you did in a previous lifetime. And so uh, you just have to work through it until you get into your next life. So what was the spiritual or the, the other reason for, for having this accident in that young age then? What, what was the reason? Sides? Because, no, it's, you know, that normally that would have scared anyone off or flying again or losing interest. In no, because I knew why it happened. I just started to spin too low. And uh, <clears throat> if I was paying attention to my altitude, I wouldn't have started it. But the altimeter is reading in meters and I wasn't even sure what altitude I started it at, but I started a three-turn spin, and at the second turn, I looked and I saw a barn go by, and I was thinking, holy shit, I'm low. And, you know, by the time that, you know, I hit, but uh, I knew that it was my fault, and, you know, I love to fly, so just because I got banged up didn't mean that I was going to stay away with it, I would stay away from it. So what about this, you've got to work through karma, from a previous life, what philosophy have you adopted with that? Um, what the hell's going on out there? Uh, the purpose of us being on Earth <clears throat> is to um, learn how to live, is for our souls to mature, to learn how to live with integrity and learn how to live without envy, hate, or greed. And also to express our love to our family each and every day, uh, as much as we can, uh, and that doesn't mean I love you, honey, as you're flying out the door. That's all we have to do on Earth. We don't have to worry about Africa, the war in the Middle East, uh, this or that. That's all we have to do. And when we die, we get um, we uh, we enter this huge lobby. And if you see what Steve Jobs said when uh, he died, his whole family is around his bed, and the last words he said was. Uh, oh, oh my, oh my, something like that, three times. And he was seeing the lobby because it is so huge and fantastic. And then you're entered up there and uh, <clears throat> whoever you happen to believe in on earth escorts you into the lobby. If you believe in God, God's there. If you believe in uh, Jesus, he's there to enter. If you believe in uh, the Buddha, the Buddha enters uh, in the lobby. If you believe in... Uh, if you're Muslim and uh, Allah, Allah meets you there. Me, I believe in the great pumpkin. pumpkin. So the great pumpkin will meet me and escort me into the lobby. You get to meet your family or whoever happens to be around the lobby when the time you get there. And then they take you to a room where you see uh, the good things you did in your life and the bad things you did in your life. And they know everything. There isn't the slightest little thing you could hide uh, nasty that you did in your life that they don't know about. 
there is no judgment. They don't have any judgment, whether it's good or bad. But if you haven't learned how to live with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed, back to Earth, or one of the billion times a billion uh, prison planets where people are, go to mature their soul. So, uh, <clears throat> is this a philosophy that you've got as a result of your crash and you went out of body or something else? No, I was just floating above. Yeah, I was out of my body. I was just floating above and I looked down and I said, you're not going to make it. This, the, you've got too much damage. And I know why I said that is because the, the road from uh, Roll, uh, where the boarding school was, to Geneva was bumpy. And I could feel these bumps and it was rattling my insides. And that's what made me think, you're not going to make it. I, there's just too much that's, that's hurt in there. So anyway, one of the reasons that you hear about the little greys here, they're just robots, glorified robots, and their job is to um, pick you up once when you're three, once when you're seven, once when you're 13. They take you to the moon, and they be sure that everything's operating okay. The same as if you have taken in your car for a 3,000-mile inspection. Oil's okay, uh, change the oil, uh, fan belt's okay, water's okay, check the battery fluid, that kind of stuff. That's what they do. Then after 13, you're picked up as, a, as necessary, but sometimes, sometimes it's not necessary. The other thing they do is they be sure that, you know, life is already written, it's already a plan, it's already, around, already written out exactly how it's supposed to happen. And if you happen to be in an accident like I was and die, die before your time or you know, get seriously hurt before your time, they see that you live. So in the very short span between the time uh, I was five feet from the ground, they came in and they made the, uh, the um, crash just less enough that it wouldn't kill me. And uh, so you know, that's why I'm alive. So did you meet them? Have gone out of body after? No. Or oh, a different time? No. So uh, that's why I uh, that's why I lived. And, so you and, met the Greys, then? Have you remembered them? Have you seen no, them? I don't remember them. So yeah, where that does doesn't explain your philosophy? Why you think it's a great pumpkin that will come and meet you? I'm just kidding. That's a yeah. Well, <laughs> I say the great pumpkin because so many people believe in God. There's no God. I mean, this the universe is infinite. It goes on forever. It's billions and billions and billions of galaxies you know, big, but there's no end. And so the people say, well, you know, the Lord Jesus, you know, went and sent it to the God and God take care of us. That didn't happen. There couldn't possibly be a God who administers over how big this universe is. It's enormous. You can't even get the average person to tell you how big the universe is. So I use the great pumpkin rather than say to everybody that there's no God or, you know, Jesus didn't exist. He wasn't mentioned in the first in the Old Testament, you know. He was just a, you know. Uh, um, Hi, this is John Lear. I'm not at all. Back to uh, <clears throat> the Great Pumpkin. Yeah, the Great punk, Pumpkin. The reason uh, I I said Great Pumpkin is because people um, resent sometimes when you say that God doesn't exist, and and I have to tell them that you know a force exists. The same things are in place uh, that you believe in. But there's no God. I mean, there couldn't, couldn't be one guy that uh, looks over this, this entire universe with, with, with there's no end and, uh, and do the things that he's alleged to do. And um, so that's why I use a great pumpkin. But then you, again, you say you refer to he as a, as a, a guy sitting somewhere, which you discover is not true. But people now talk about God as source. So Say God. Source. A force? No, not force, but the source. The source? Yes, the source principle as being God, which is no, the I... universe looking back at itself. And the, they also talk about, and I, I do also, about the higher, higher um, consciousness. So when you talk about you say the meaning of life is to live with integrity here on earth? That's not the meaning of life. That's how to get into, the, um, uh, into where the adults are, into where the adults play. To grow. Yeah. That's the point of you know, this experience here. Yeah. So to learn, uh, to learn what we call higher consciousness. 
that reflects that there is such a thing as higher. You can, you can talk about then higher beings, but people now talk about the source, which is meaningful. To some people, if they want to, whatever they want to believe in, that's okay with me. Mm. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't have any DVDs. I don't write any books. Uh, I don't have any tapes. You know, I'm just looking for the truth. And if anybody wants to listen to what I have to say, they're welcome to. They don't have to believe in it because I don't sell anything, you know. And uh, if they want to try to sell me, you know, God or something like that, I just don't have time because I have, you know, I'm busy doing other stuff. And I agree, you know, you can have your God, you know, everything like that, but don't bother me with it. So what do you mean by cleaning out the Petri dish? That was a term that I used when I didn't know anything when I first started in this. And it was kind of obvious that every 25,000 years that this earth was tumbled uh, so that these great civilizations, earth has been here for like 20 to 25 billion years. And there's been these great civilizations grow and, uh, uh, and, and become civilizations on earth, but they don't last forever. There comes a time uh, and a reason why they have to be dissolved. So they mix the earth up and, and pile mountains on. And, you know, if you went around Earth, there's probably a hundred different fantastic civilizations buried under the Himalayas or the Sahara Desert or under the Atlantic or whatever of these, these uh, civilizations that have been before. So when I said clean out the Petri dish, this is what I was uh, thinking they did. That, that's not right. Uh, but it may be right in a certain way. All they're doing is getting re uh, ready for the next um, source, uh, the next people that come along, if they're humans or whatever they happen to be growing. Have you picked this philosophy up during meeting other people as you've flown around, or just something this is, this is part of your nature? No, this comes from uh, Sleeper, Lou Baldwin, and he started uh, <clears throat> he started uh, posting on Above Top Secret in uh, the summer of uh, 2005. And uh, when I started reading his stuff, it had it, it already gone to about 115 pages. And I thought it was interesting. It said, um, are extraterrestrials real? Yes, as real as the nose on your face. So I read through about 20 pages and I instinctively knew this guy has done that. He's been there. And um, I want to hear more of this. What made that appeal? What was the thing which, which was the, the one single I mean, thing? A lot of stuff on those films. He, he talked about all his uh, life. He grew up in Italy. He was the son of a U.S. serviceman. He became a U.S. serviceman himself. And all during the time he was growing up and in the service, the aliens would come and pick him up and take him for tours around the universe, everywhere, and feed him all this information. And he could never figure what, why they were doing this. And he had, uh, you know, total recall of all the different places he went and all the stuff. And um, he wrote two books, uh, we wrote five books, but two of them were In League with the UFO, which is the story of what um, the U.S. did with the Roswell crash, what they found on the ship, how they, um, how they uh, tried to use it, and uh, all the little things that were there. And the other is, uh, in, uh, the other is um, A Day with an Extraterrestrial, and it's a kind of a neat story about how they come and pick him up in, Sam in uh, Kansas City, where he lives, and take him to the farthest reaches of the universe uh, in one day, and, and just it's, it's kind of neat. So anyway, um, I got to the 20th page of his post, and what really got to me was he described how he would uh, be taken uh, by the ETs when he worked with the Army, that they would send a uh, U.S. Uh, um, serviceman to pick him up, and they would take him to the outside of a hangar. And when he'd walk in the, the, the street side of a hangar, there would be these cardboard um, hallways built. I mean, not cardboard, plywood. Plywood hallways, which would lead 
to the craft and he never saw the craft he would just go in the craft and there'd be a u.s serviceman standing at the entrance um, and the u.s serviceman had no say in what was going on they were just there to provide the plywood hallway and the space where to park the ship so uh, that was what told me this guy is telling the truth well we're coming to the end of our first section so we take a little bit of breather and then talk about all that stuff in detail in part two. Okay.